Hello everyone, uh, great to be here. I'll speak in English because unfortunately my German is non-existent. Um, we're a little bit behind, so uh, I think I'll, I'll catch up uh, just fine. It and I want to talk available. about the future of infrastructure as a service in a Docker world. So it's just uh -huh. a little bit thought-provoking. Uh, yeah, I think uh -huh. she's still talking, right? Yeah. <laughs> Good? Okay. So it's a little bit, you know, it's aimed to be a little bit thought provoking. Uh, just some ideas about what Docker means, you know, when we've been talking about clouds the last, the last few years. Uh, a little bit of background about me. I'm uh, right now an open source architect at Citrix. Uh, I work in the open source business office. I'm also the vice president elect of Apache CloudStack. I'll talk about CloudStack uh, the next uh, workshop. Uh, I'm on the programming, program management committee of Apache Leap Cloud, one of the API wrappers uh, on top of all those cloud providers, member of the Apache Software Foundation, and I have the pleasure to be writing the O'Reilly Docker Cookbook, uh, which is in early release. So when we talk about clouds, we, you know, we, we've been talking about it for the last several years. Really, the, the goals that we, you know, we had with, with cloud was really to, to make computing a utility, uh, just you know, electricity. Uh, utility computing is an old uh, principle, you know, even from the 60s. Uh, but that's really where we were trying to, to go. So elasticity of the infrastructure, we wanted to be able to, you know, instantly scale the infrastructure. Uh, having a, a concept of on-demand, so I want a new server, I want this server to be on right now, give it to me, I want three, boom, I have three, just, just like this. Uh, pay as you go, so we didn't want to have all that capital investment uh, up front and just you know pay as uh, as we were needing more resources. And of course, when the cloud systems were built, uh, the biggest issue was multi-tenancy because we were going to multiplex users on those resources. So we wanted to have a way to to, to have strong encapsulation of all those users. So multi-tenancy was one of the the key requirements of those systems. And of course, programmable access. And I think that's, that's what the cloud has brought us, is an API layer on top of all those services. So not only infrastructure as a service, but you know, platforms, SaaS, and so on. So the, the ability to have an API at all those layers has really empowered developers uh, to, to bring in you know, innovation and, uh, as was mentioned, uh, a rapid um, you know, agility. So those were the, the cloud goals. And you know, of course, I, I'm taking an example from, from CloudStack. I look at all the clouds that are in production right now. Uh, British Telecom, SwissTax, you know, we have Rene here, LisWeb in the uh, Netherlands, Exoscale that we just heard about, Ecula in France, Interroot. Those are just a few CloudStack clouds. Um, oh, and actually, I Okay, those are just a few cloud stack clouds. If you look at Open Nebula and, and OpenStack, you'll, you, you'll find also a bunch of other clouds that are in production. They're not in test, it's not an experiment, you know, they're in prod, and, and those guys are making money with their cloud that's in production right now. So that's, that's very important. Uh, and I'm like, well, if all these guys are in production with clouds, you know, let's say it's a solved problem. Okay, building a cloud is a solved problem. And of course, since I'm a CloudStack guy, I'll tell you, you know, you want to build a cloud, you want it to run, just use CloudStack. Yeah, that's my pitch. Okay, that was quick. But, you know, once you have your cloud, you know, the, the problems are not solved. You've addressed the, the goals of the cloud that I mentioned of utility and uh, on-demand access and so on. But what about the application? And that's really what you're trying to do. You're trying to deploy application quickly, you're trying to bring it down, you're trying to scale the application, you're trying to be able to port the application from cloud to cloud, compose services, you know, all that application lifecycle is really key. The cloud is just, you know, your infrastructure, you want it there, you want it available, reliable, and with the cloud you are able to program that infrastructure. But the cloud itself is not bringing you, at least the infrastructure service is not bringing you the application lifecycle. That's where things like Slipstream you know, come into play. So, you know, 
you, you look at the old cloud ecosystem that has developed over the last five years, you have tons of things. You have API uh, wrappers, like I mentioned, Leap Cloud. You have configuration management system like Chef, Ansible, and so on, SaltStack. Uh, you have some PaaS solution like Scalar, Cloudify, Six Square, uh, things like Vagrant for developers. So the, the ecosystem around the cloud has really boomed, and we have tons of tools now that we can, that we can use that you know, sysadmins, developers can use to tackle that problem of application uh, lifecycle. But it's still not, you know, super easy, even though we have, you know, a bunch of tools. And I think that's where, that's where Docker comes in play, okay? So Docker really, uh, you know, brings new life and, and makes it easy to manage applications, uh, and I'll, we'll talk about it, but in the cloud. So a few basics on Docker originated from uh, .cloud. Originally, it was a wrapper on top of LXC, Linux containers. And really, to me, the, the, the thing that's amazing about Docker is the user experience. Okay, Let, let's forget about you know, potential issues with security, blah, blah. Um, I, you know, security is a big thing. But if you start using Docker, the user experience as a developer, as somebody who is managing an application, the user experience, the simplicity is really amazing. So ease of use is, is really uh, you know, great. And there is an apparent speed compared to VMs, even though the comparison with VMs is really wrong. You know, it's like Apple and oranges. Of course, it's going to be faster because it's a, it's a container. Containers are not new. We can go back a long way with Solaris zones, uh, things like OpenVZ and so on. The big thing here is that they are not an hypervisor. Okay? They don't give you the, a full uh, operating guest operating system. It's really the same kernel that's in the host. And it's really a process that has, that has some uh, isolation with the C groups and its own namespace. Um, and if you, haven't, if you haven't played with Docker, really, it's super easy to install. Okay? So just one line, you have Docker. And you have to keep in mind that Docker is a single host uh, thing. Okay? It's a one daemon running on one machine. Okay, it's not a clustered system, it's not a magical pass or anything like this. It's just a daemon running on one machine. And you can get it on your laptop very quickly. Now the thing that you know, it becomes extremely interesting is that this single command here, docker run, you know, I'm just echoing foobar, so that's a, a silly example. But you install docker and bang, you're able to start containers. And here, the, the, the second example, I get a shell. Uh, in, a, in a running container. I get an interactive shell in a, in a container. So super easy. Uh, so that's fine. You, you, you start getting excited about Docker because it's very easy to use. And now you discover the App Store. And that's where we go back to that, that concept of the application and where it helps you with managing application. Um, Docker comes up with the Docker Hub, which is a, a registry of you know, Docker images that contains application. So when you do docker pool run seb slash application, it's actually downloading a Docker image from a registry and installing it locally on my machine. And the application would be called, you know, application. And then here I run that application. So it comes with an app store, and that's something that we haven't had with uh, with VMs, or at least not that you know easily uh, offered. Um, of course, VM images are pretty big, and you know, that might be an issue, but some Docker images can also be quite big. Uh, but the App Store with Docker is really something that, that's amazing. So that's what you have here in terms of lifecycle life with Docker. Uh, you have this App Store right there that you can pull from. You have images locally, you run them, you know, and you get, you get containers. Suddenly, you have your application running. Uh, so that's, that's great. And of course, there are lots of caveats because you know, one container is easy, but what you'll soon exper experience is that you need you know, maybe 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 containers all talking to each other. That's when it becomes really uh, problematic. Now, how do you use something like this, which is, you know, helps you to package application? How do you use something like this with the cloud? Okay? So building your cloud is a solved problem. Okay? OpenStack, CloudStack, Open Nebula. Now, how are you going to put Docker and, and how are the two linked? So the first gut reaction that a lot of people have had is, well, let's write a Docker plugin for our infrastructure as a service solution and let's treat Docker as a hypervisor. Okay? Just like we treat KVM or like we treat Zen, let's treat Docker as a hypervisor. 
the thing is that it's not a hypervisor, okay? And the networking model uh, is going to be extremely complex because Docker does lots of NAT you know, things and port mapping and, and so on, so it's going to be very complex. And then, really, the strength uh, of Docker is to compose those, those services. Remember when I mentioned, you know, I talked about the, the application lifecycle and composing services uh, for your application. Uh, if you just create a, a hypervisor-like plugin for Docker, it's not going to solve the composability of services. Okay, so I think this is really a bad idea. And OpenStack, you know. Uh, that dove straight with that model, and I, I think that's really the, the wrong model. And then you have the question, but where is Docker uh, going to run? Uh, on bare metal? So now your YAS needs to manage bare metal. Is it going to run on VM? So now you need to start VMs, have Docker in them, run, yeah? Or in the cloud, you know? So that, that becomes a, an interesting problem. So, of course, what's, what's going on right now is that we run Docker in virtual machines. And some people are, you know, are not very happy about this because they think it's, it's counterintuitive, you shouldn't do this. And, and my answer to this is, remember, everything is going public cloud, okay? Of course, we're going to have private clouds, we're going to have on-premise infrastructure. But a very large portion of the infrastructure is going to be public cloud. So if you access public cloud and your application is containerized and you run it you know, over there in the public cloud, it's going to run in virtual machines. Virtual machines gives you full isolation between all the users, so that's where it's going to run. So when we look at AWS, uh, well, the default AMI in AWS, Linux AMI, now has uh, Docker. It's a little bit far-fetched because, in fact, what they, what they only did is that they put the Docker repo as a basic install. You still need to actually install the package. Uh, GCE, the Google Cloud, has a container optimized VMs. Uh, Azure has Docker templates. And then we, we saw Exascale, they have CoreOS templates. Okay? So now you want to run Docker in the cloud, it's easy. Just start one of those Linux templates and you have the Docker daemon running. As simple as that. The trend that we are seeing, though, is that <coughs> Coming with Docker is that we've seen a bunch of new operating systems coming, uh, you know, being built, which I think is, is quite new. You know, we have, of course, all the well-known Linux distribution, but now we have a, a new type of Linux distribution. Uh, Atomic from Red Hat, CoreOS, of course, has led the way. Uh, that logo is Ubuntu Snappy. There's Rancher OS, uh, and there's a bunch of new ones, like recently, like uh, Hive and... Um, there's one from VMware and then one from Microsoft, I think. Nano, yeah, Nano came up. So you have new operating systems that are coming up that are optimized for containers. They're making the assumption that the only thing that's going to run in that machine is a container. You cannot run anything else. If you want to run something in those Linux distribution, it has to be a container. Okay? So that's, that's interesting. And that plays very well with your infrastructure as a service. Because now, instead of offering Ubuntu 14.04, Red Hat 7, now you start in your cloud, what you need to do is to offer those uh, Docker-optimized uh, Linux distribution. Okay? And we know how to do this. And in CloudStack, of course, uh, you, know, you, you, you can do it. So examples, CoreOS, uh, you know, you, we, we are seeing it uh, in production in several public clouds out there. Uh, but we'll surely see more, like you know, Snappy, Atomic, Rancher, Nano, and, and, and so on. And that really doesn't impact the EAS solution. It's really a problem of service offering. What are you offering in your cloud? If you offer those Linux distribution, you're offering Docker to your, uh, to your customers. Uh, CoreOS, this is just a little bit of a note on CoreOS and, and how, it's, how it's being done. CoreOS builds nightly their, their distribution. And the guys from Exoscale developed uh, a CloudStack plugin. There is also a Rackspace image for CoreOS, which basically is an OpenStack one. I don't know if there is an Open Nebula one. But you know, basically, that template uses lots of cloud in it uh, magic. It's not that magic. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but basically, you get that template that's being built by CoreOS, stick it in your cloud, and you, and you have it. Now, the other way to integrate it with your infrastructure is uh, to have now a container service. Okay? 
And we're seeing this with Amazon, they are offering Elastic Container Service. We're seeing it with Google, they have the Google Container Engine with Kubernetes. Uh, we are seeing solutions like Lattice from Cloud Foundry. Mesos has support for containers. Uh, Rancher is another solution out there. So we're seeing platforms for containers, and those platforms can just be deployed on your cloud. So you'll start a bunch of machines and then install those platforms for containers, and then you'll you run containers. So basically, you're seeing now Docker platforms as a workload in your cloud. And I, really, I, I think that's really the, you know, the way to go if you want to expose a, a container service. Uh, the last thing, of course, is if you look at the Docker ecosystem, we're seeing uh, plugins for all the different cloud solutions out there. So things like Docker machines have plugins for all the cloud providers. Now, that's really you know, Docker and infrastructure as a service uh, integration. And, and the takeaway here, really, do not try to write a new hypervisor plugin. I don't think that makes any sense. Uh, but really, you know, let the Docker ecosystem itself orchestrate all the containers. Don't, don't make your VM orchestrator, don't try to make your VM orchestrator a container orchestrator. Okay? You're just adding bloat to your software here. Okay? Just deal with the VMs and let the Docker ecosystem deal with the containers. Okay? Uh, and as an infrastructure system, we should focus on the Docker-optimized distribution as service offering in, your cl in our clouds. And then we should focus on application management frameworks. So things like Mesos and Kubernetes. Okay? So those are just like, uh, you know, if you're trying to deploy Hadoop or Storm or things like this uh, in your cloud, you know, if you deploy those, now you're offering a container service. Okay? So now on to you know, a little bit, uh, little bit more controversial things. Um, this is all very interesting because, as I mentioned, Docker is a single node system. And very quickly, when people got you know, hyped up on Docker, they were like, oh, yeah, but I want more than one container. And I want you know, to run those containers on 10 machines, on 20 machines. Oh, I need an orchestrator for containers. Oh, I need a cluster management system for my containers. Okay, uh, and it's, it's very interesting to see that wheel, you know, being reinvented, uh, and that's a picture of Kubernetes. So basically, what do you have in most cluster management system? You have a master node that talks to a bunch of workers. No big deal. It's been going on for you know years. Uh, what do you have in those clusters? You have a load balance clustered master pool. Worst case, it's one master node. Okay, best case, you know, you have a cluster with quorum election, load balancing, and so on. You have your worker nodes that have some type of agent for executing jobs. You have service discovery, registration, and maybe a DNS service. You have an API server because you want to talk to it programmatically. And then you have a scheduler that takes all those requests and then, you know, assigns them to, to your workers. It's, it's a very basic architecture. It's been going on for you know, a long time. Uh, the question is, you know, when you look at those cluster systems, what is the job that you're sending to that, that cluster? Uh, and I'm saying it's been going on for a while because I come from HPC, High Performance Computing, and, and we've been doing clusters for a, you know, quite a while. So the workload in a cluster system can be a scientific uh, computing program, just a code that you've developed, maybe parallel computing, maybe the processes talk to each other. It can be batch processing, a lot of like, uh, like the CERN guys do, lots of batch processing for analyzing data. Uh, if your cluster system is an infrastructure as a service like CloudStack, then the job that you're sending to that cluster is, A, hey, start that virtual machine. Okay, you have a pool of hypervisor, you have a management server, you talk to it through an API, and you say, hey, start that VM. Okay, so that's no different. The job here in the YAS is to start a VM. And in Mesos, Mesos is also a clustered management system. Here, Mesos is very nice because it allows you to mix workload types through frameworks. So frameworks is a, you know, kind of a name in, in Mesos, though. so you can, if you want to run MPI jobs, you have a, a framework for MPI. If you want to run Hadoop, you have a framework for Hadoop. If you want to run long-running services, you have Aurora, for example, like Twitter is using. Uh, Mesos also has a Docker containerizer. 
So the job here for Mesos is, hey, I want you to start this container. It talks to, the, to Mesos, and then Mesos finds a node and, and starts the, the container. Interestingly, in Mesos, there is now a pending support for QMU as an agent. Okay? So, I'll get back to it in a little bit. But there is also Kubernetes. Who has heard about Kubernetes? Right. So Kubernetes is absolutely amazing. <laughs> and I do quite a bit of uh, you know, tech watch around it these days. It's the cluster manager for Google for their entire infrastructure. That's not exactly quite right. Uh, it's inspired by uh, Borg, so the, uh, what's managing Google infrastructure and what's running all their services. And it's been open source last year uh, around June, so it's been a year. And hold on, if Kubernetes is now open source and Google Compute Engine is a Google service, the Google Cloud is actually a job in Kubernetes, okay? So it's like Google Cloud is now open source. That's very interesting because when, when everything started with OpenStack and, and CloudStack and Open Nebula, some of the folks said, well, wouldn't it be nice if Amazon just open sourced EC2? Right? If, almost, if Amazon had open sourced EC2 in 2006, nobody, we wouldn't have seen OpenStack, CloudStack, Open Nebula. Everybody would have built their private cloud on the open source of EC2. Okay? Period. Okay? All field would have been dead. But they didn't do it. And actually, open source uh, Amazon is pretty much uh, closed source locked in, right? Now, Kubernetes is amazing because that means that now we can run Google Cloud. Okay. It's a little bit tricky to understand, but if you read at, at the paper, they'll say that in Google, everything is a container. That's because they built that cluster management system before even hardware virtualization existed, before KVM and, and VTX. Okay? They did that before. So everything was really, they were trying to do process isolation from the beginning, even before Docker, uh, so it was LXE based, and they built their own container engine and, and, and so on. So everything, in Google Infra is a container, even virtual machines. So virtual machines at Google, virtual machines that you start in the Google Cloud actually run in containers. That's not me inventing this, because if you listen to John Welks from, uh, from Google, he actually says it in his, in his talks, and it's written in the, in the Google uh, uh, Borg paper. So I, I was very startled by this, and then the guys from Rancher came up with Rancher VM which is a KVM image, QCow image, that you can start in a Docker container, assuming your host has KVM, okay? Uh, so what I did, I wrote a blog post uh, when, uh, last month where I started VMs using Kubernetes, okay? And then Joe Beda, who is uh, like uh, the lead architect, who used to be the lead architect for Google Cloud said, yes, that's similar to what is done for GCE, okay? So my point here is that if you're trying to build a cloud, you could actually start using Kubernetes instead of CloudStack, OpenStack, and run all your VMs in containers, just like Google. So Google has just open sourced the Google Compute Engine, okay? Let's ponder on that. <laughs> I think it's... It. So, Kubernetes allows you to build a clone of the Google Compute Engine and manage VMs. So you can manage containers and you can manage VMs exactly the same way and it builds resi uh, resiliency, it, build, it gives you a DNS service, self-discovery, replication, lots of amazing things. Mesos will soon support QMU. That means that you'll be able to start KVM virtual machine through Mesos. Not containerized, okay, but just as, as pure VMs on, on host. This is, this is coming. Uh, both allow you to run mixed workloads. So you could have a cluster of uh, bare metal. Uh, you could run some tasks on bare metal, not in VMs, not containerized, just plain old bare metal. And you could run VMs if you wanted to. You could run containers if you wanted to. You could run a Hadoop cluster. That's what Mesos does. It allows you to run mixed workloads, okay? 
So why run OpenStack or CloudStack or Open Nebula? Okay. So to me, you know, I think uh, Google just killed all those projects, and I'm saying this as the VP of CloudStack. Okay, I'm, I'm not saying this uh, just to bash on OpenStack. I don't think it's going to happen because there is too much momentum in those projects. But pretty much, you know, somebody who would have a little bit of guts would take Kubernetes and start developing on it, and very quickly they would have a competitive uh, solution to these projects based on all the knowledge that Google has had for the last 10 years. I think that's, that would be pretty sweet. So thank you very much. Follow me on Twitter, buy my books. That's my retirement plan. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. There is some time for some questions. And we will, uh, we didn't talk about, you will have a workshop after, late in the afternoon, and you will talk about OpenStack, no? Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Please. Oh. There's a question. Maybe you, you can read this. What's the good use of uh, of Kubernetes? And so, what do you, what should you do with Kubernetes? You shouldn't do with Mesos and vice versa, because there's an overlap, but the overlap is is, is partial. You have to go back in the picture. I have to go back in the picture. Okay. Um, so if you if you read the the, the papers on uh, on Borg and even uh, Omega and so on, um, Mesos was heavily inspired by uh, the work at Google. Okay, and it's all about mixing workloads so that you can maximize utilization in your clusters, because they are saying that even if they lose 10% utilization, they're gonna lose millions every day, because their data center are, are so big. So Mesos you know, to me is actually a, a very early implementation of what Google, uh, you know, was doing. Okay. So Mesos is an early implementation of what Google uh, has been doing. Um, and Mesos is being used in production even by folks like Twitter, for example. That's one of the, the big use cases. So definitely Mesos has lots of legs in terms of uh, stability and production use cases. Okay? Now, Kubernetes, uh, you know, I see it as a, as a new implementation of the ideas that went into Mesos. So it's a new, it's a new evolution and it doesn't have all the, the, the know-how in terms of production stability and, and, and so on. But pretty much, you should expect that any type of workloads that you can run on Mesos, you know, you'll be able to do it in, in Kubernetes. So I don't see a difference in terms of uh, use cases, you know, some use cases better for Mesos or some use cases better for Kubernetes. I think Kubernetes is the new, is the new Mesos, pretty much. Thank you. <laughs>